Yes, okay, perfect. So welcome everybody. I'm very pleased to introduce Cameron uh, Brick. Cameron is an assistant professor of social psychology with tenure and he uh, works at the University of Amsterdam where he supervises a research group in environmental psychology. Uh, the group studies how individuals react to collective problems, especially with a focus on climate change. And they use surveys and experiments to predict behavior from beliefs, identities, demographics, and social contexts. Uh, Cameron uh, gained a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology at Reed College and a Master of Arts in Social Psychology at the University of California in Santa Barbara and a PhD from the same university in Santa Barbara. Uh, his research is uh, very interesting, which is, which is why I'm pleased that he came here to Trento to talk about it and stems from uh, behaviors, uh, sustainable behaviors on clothing or uh, how pro environmental behaviors correlate with each other and uh, self report and bias in environmental uh, psychology measures. Um, so I, I won't spoil the, the talk because it's going to be much more interesting when he talks about it. Uh, I met Cameron back in 2020, and actually today is the first time we met physically. Um, we met on Zoom originally when I was writing my master's degree and I had just switched to environmental psychology. So he was a very supportive and patient and knowledgeable collaborator uh, to help me write that thesis. And then we went on to collaborate on other projects, one of them we'll talk about today. So I'm very uh, happy that he's here today. Uh, so without further ado, I'll just leave the stage to Cameron. Thanks again for- coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, I haven't been to this region of Italy before, so it's, a, it's just a treat. I also am an associate professor of environmental psychology at the Inland Norway University of Applied Sciences, but that position was temporary and it's ending this month. Um, so, as a classic social psychologist, I used to think of what my job was as producing models that would be of interest to other psychologists. But lately, I have been trying to imagine what it would look like if I produced work that was inter of interest to other groups. And in particular, in environmental psychology, we're trying to make some sort of actual difference about uh, the sustainable development goals, about uh, climate change. And so to do so, and I hope this is a theme that uh, you see throughout the talk, is I'm wondering what kinds of study outputs would actually sound useful to someone who's not a social scientist, or at least who's not a social psychologist. And I have to say, I highly recommend this um, action plan for psychologists. I was surprised how um, concrete and useful it is for education. There's a section on teaching, there's a section on research, and there's a section on uh, how organizations run themselves. Uh, for example, food, conferences, that sort of thing. So this has been my inspiration lately, a little bit outside of my discipline. And uh, a really big influence on my thinking is this group. Um, and it, it, in particular, Christian Nielsen and uh, Sebastian Berger, who's not uh, pictured there, um, Florian Lange and the others. Um, and we have just published this paper. So I will frame the talk by presenting you the main points of this paper and give you some examples. A couple of years ago, I would give a version of this talk that had all, much of the same content, but finally now I can tell you what we have been doing to try and substantiate some of these recommendations. So the paper presents a research agenda for doing behavioral science that can make a bigger impact on public policy, on conservation, on mitigating climate change. We make six main recommendations. And it's not uh, just for environmental psychologists, it's also for people who are working in other areas and interested in contributing. So in particular, the, the first uh, recommendation is study a wider range of behaviors. It has been the case in environmental psych that we have mostly focused on consumer behaviors, like which products the uh, individual chooses at the store or in addition, larger consumer products like solar panels or uh, the gas heating versus heat pumps or something like that. 
But these are all still within the range of consumer products choosing to fly versus take the ferry or whatnot. Um, but uh, Bill McKibben has a quote, which is something like, the most important thing an individual can do about climate change is to stop being an individual. And I have tried to take this to heart, and I, I highly recommend this paper by Christian, which was in Nature Energy last year. And he, he basically explains, you can be a consumer, and we can study that role, but we have many other important roles. Um, as me, for example, I mean, at the university, I, I, I speak to large groups of students and policymakers sometimes and other industry partners. I'm probably making more impact uh, through all of these roles than I am through my consumer behaviors. So we also could study those and we have began starting to do so. Um, and uh, Christian's paper also makes the point that it is particularly the people of high socioeconomic status that are uh, having the largest potential impact through these additional roles. So the people with high education, high income are worth uh, a special focus. Recommendation number two is to study non-psychological factors, or as we labeled it there, to address the complexity of behavioral determinants. Ah, it's, it seems kind of obvious stated like that, but psychologists don't do this very much. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it can be slightly uncomfortable to try and fold in all of the environmental, contextual, demographic factors. Um, but I think it's the only way to achieve that output uh, on the that I started with on the first slide. Like, the, it, it makes the difference between a statement like our work could be relevant to public policy and a statement that you might see in other fields like environmental economics, where they say something like, this is specifically useful for sustainable development goal 11 and in these ways with those partners. And I think we can achieve that if we try a little hard. So I want to show you a study that we did a couple of years ago, just to reinforce this point um, of we need to study additional non-psychological factors. We did a four country study about what predicts pro-environmental behavior. And in particular, the classic social psych self-reported scale there, number one, the environmental apparel scale had items like, I buy uh, clothing made from organically grown natural fibers. And then you would say never, sometimes, uh, often, I don't remember exactly what the options are, a bunch of items, then you average that together, you get a composite for the individual and we can consider that a person characteristic behavior. You know, maybe so someone's a 3.2 and someone else is a 4.5. That's the concept here. But very unusually, we also did a life cycle assessment of their actual specific behaviors. So instead of this vague self-report with like sometimes, always, we ask them very precise questions like how many t-shirts have you purchased within the last two weeks? And when you ask precise questions, you can actually calculate the exact greenhouse gas emissions from those behaviors. They differ in the different countries, which makes this a little bit of a pain, uh, but it can be done and you can add it all up. And then we have a kind of a carbon footprint measure for this clothing related behavior. So we have a less precise one, like the classic one, and then a more precise one. Uh, for psychological predictors, we included lots of great hits from social psych, efficacy, and goals, and uh, attitudes, which you know, maybe people call concern, norms. It doesn't actually matter so much because I'm not going to show you them separated. The point is, this is a broad range of psychological predictors. Based on 30 years of uh, environmental psychology, you would think these are going to predict the behaviors pretty strongly. What we see here is on the x-axis, all of the outcome uh, measures, meaning behavior. And on the y-axis is the strength of the correlation with each of the individual predictors. So each of those dots is one of the psychological predictors. Maybe this one's norms, that one's concern, whatever. You can see that for the environmental apparel scale, the classic vague self-report scale, the psych predictors are fairly high. There's like 0.4. This is a pretty solid correlation. But we would normally stop there and say, okay, these are the most important predictors for this behavior. 
But if you look at the results from the greenhouse gas uh, emissions outcomes, we see that the site predictors are not looking that important. How to reconcile these is a little bit difficult, but I'll just, I'll return to this later in the talk, but just hold in your mind for a second, what is being measured at the scale, if not actual clothing behavior that is impacting the environment? And then if you're paying a lot, a lot of attention, you'll notice that the psychological predictors of concern, attitudes, whatever, if anything, higher concern, higher environmental impact on those which is the opposite pattern. So not just less signal, let's say, but maybe even more. Why might that be? I'll just put a suggestion in your mind that the people who are high income, who are high education, who are concerned about climate change might also have more money to spend on clothes. If you look at the relationship between the three uh, life cycle assessment, carbon, behavior outcomes and the environmental apparel scale, indeed, uh, they are um, somewhat positively associated. This is a little bit weird because the environmental apparel scale should be down. I mean, it should be negative for these behaviors. The more of the self-reported uh, apparel scale items, it should be the less emissions, but that's not what we see. This is a major validity problem we suggest. So one of the one of the PhD students in my lab on a boss heart has been leading a project lately on how different pro environmental measures relate. This is the follow up from the previous one because I would say, well, let's measure a bunch of these behaviors at once and find out how they relate to each other. The uh, the first one is a a laboratory task, which is I'll show you in a second where they make repeated decisions. That's also the second one. And then the third one is a classic self-report scale. This is from my dissertation work, actually. Uh, like, yeah, how often do you uh, take flights? Or I think we have questions about gardening, about transportation, about food, about all kinds of things. And then number four is a, like trying to get that, that precise self-report. It's carbon footprint kind of measure. You would think, from the discipline that these would correlate very high, but we were wondering maybe they don't. It sounds like this work should have been done a while ago, but we hadn't done. Now, Sebastian Berger's carbon emissions task pits people in a consequential task where they have to make repeated decisions for personal benefit, getting more money out of the task, and we do pay them, or uh, environmental harm. What they do is they choose between two options, and one option typically pays them a little bit, but also does some environmental harm. Critically for this task, we do actually do the environmental damage. We do this because we buy certificates from the carbon emissions trading scheme of the EU, and then if they choose to protect the environment, we destroy the certificates. But if we, uh, basically you, can imagine that you're giving a company either permission to pollute a little bit or you're not giving them permission, you're taking it out of the system, which effectively rises, raises the price of carbon for everyone. So you do a bunch of these 20 of these tasks, whatever, you get a sort of a willingness to pollute for each individual. In the other task, it's a time cost. You are supposed to circle certain of these uh, figures based on what digits they have, like circle this one and that one, super boring task. It's very uh, frustrating for the individual, but we tell them the more of these pages they complete, the more we will donate to an environmental organization, then we actually make those donations. So how many pages do they complete? So in each of these tasks, this one money, that one time, we're, we're giving people an opportunity to demonstrate in real time their willingness to uh, do environmental conservation. These have a major advantage. It's that you can, in the lab, actually observe something and maybe experimentally manipulate it. What we don't know is what is being measured by this. It has face validity for uh, pro-environmental behavior, but I still don't know what it is. So we have a bunch of the predictors and the outcomes here. This is a uh, heat map. I think it's a little bit easier to read than the table of numbers. And you can just see that uh, the blue numbers are positive correlations. I mean, 
the biggest thing to say off the bat is most things don't correlate with each other very much. To highlight carbon footprint doesn't seem to correlate with the other uh, behavior measures, or if anything correlates negatively, like we were seeing in the previous study. And that's the, that's the measure that's closest to environmental impact. I mean, if you really wanted to do something about sustainable development goals, that's the measure, not these other ones that are more psychological. I also would like to show you the, that the carbon footprint does correlate with some of the uh, predictors, but in particular, it's correlating with demographic predictors, income, wealth, not like classic social psychology variables, but if they're the most important, then that's where we should be looking. And I want to also highlight that the classic uh, self-report scale, um, the thing that correlates with it most is environmentalist identity, seeing oneself as an environmentalist. I mean, in my previous work, I was writing paper after paper about identity. It seemed very important because it was constantly correlating with our outcome measure. But it, identity doesn't correlate that much with the other outcome measures. There may be something specific about these vague self-report uh, uh, scales that is kind of measuring a propensity or a almost like an attitude, not uh, not really as much a behavior behavior. That's what I'm coming around to now. Another project we did in the meanwhile, well, because we were becoming a little bit suspicious of the scales that we had been using, is to um, use this, yeah. We, we did a, a this, this paper has two studies, but I'll just talk about the second one. We were wondering whether when people are responding to these self-reported vague scales, uh, what is causing all the variance in these scales, if not their actual impactful behaviors? One of the possibilities is some kind of social desirability, answering what they think they're supposed to answer or demonstrating or avoiding certain identities. And one of the ways you can get into this uh, there has been previous work suggesting there's no social desirability effects on these kinds of measures, but I wasn't sure I believed it. One of the ways you can get into this is using this covert question uh, type. I really like this. This is a technique from health psychology. Let's say you wanted to interview a bunch of teenagers about their risky sex, safe sex behaviors or about uh, drug use, or maybe you want to pull in a dictatorship, support for the dictator. And people will not be willing to answer these questions, uh, even online, even anonymously, very truthfully. But what you can do is ask them a bunch of questions. My birthday is on an even day. I exercise regularly, whatever. And then ask them, how many of these statements apply to you? And they might answer three. But it's quite deniable which ones, right? So you give them a more uh, anonymous opportunity. And you just have some people randomized to these items, and then some people randomized to these items plus one, the, the item that you're actually interested in. Now, because of this between subjects design, you don't get to then correlate with predictors very easily because it halves your sample right away. Uh, and the, uh, the calculation of how often these behaviors are happening depends on multiple individuals. So you don't get to look at the kind of plot I showed you a moment ago, but I can tell you the estimates of how often do people do this with this covert method was much lower than how often they said they do it using a normal questionnaire. And to me, that was a surprise because I'm thinking an online anonymous Baltric survey is quite anonymous, but apparently it doesn't feel anonymous to them or something. I'm not 100% sure. And to go back to the identity for a second, one of the results that really caught my eye is that in the covert condition, how much someone saw themselves as an environmentalist does not predict uh, their report of the behavior. That is to say, seeing yourself as an environmentalist and wanting to be one is not related to how, who is doing more of this anti-littering behavior. But in the control condition, in the typical survey results, it is predicted. I, I, I can't tell you that this is for sure social desirability, but it, it smells like it. So that was a long uh, jaunt around recommendation number two, which is to use uh, non-psychological factors 
and uh, and we make some recommendations about which ones to use. But this is kind of a return to Kurt Lewin, classic social psychology, actually, to pay attention to context. Uh, we just not we just haven't been doing it very well. And I, I think I can understand why, because it's difficult to publish. And if you want to publish, it makes sense to show large effects with psychological predictors. But maybe that's bending us towards the wrong outcome measures. The, the third thing I'd like to talk about is uh, focusing on mitigation potential. Actually, maybe this is a good time since these are more technical words to say. I'm very happy to take questions during. Uh, please do interrupt. I'll raise your hand. So there have been some uh, suggestions from Tom Dietz in Michigan, from uh, Paul Stern, from other uh, important figures in, in social and environmental science that we should be selecting our outcome measures based on which ones would be most likely to make a big difference. I mean, to the actual process of climate change. And I think that that has not been the way that we mo most often have selected outcome measures. Um, and it's not just find, a, find an item with a high technical potential, such as um, reducing airline flying uh, versus, I don't know, turning off the lights when you leave the room. That, that is helpful, of course. That would be technical potential, but we also need to consider the behavioral plasticity. Some behaviors are more changeable than others. It turns out that commuting by car is particularly inelastic. Economists have noticed this for a long time. It's very hard to get people to stop commuting by car. If you change, for example, how expensive it is, if you make it take longer, if you whatever, make parking difficult, people still drive by car. So this is not the area that we should be mostly leaning into if we're trying to make effective uh, interventions. Uh, at least it wouldn't be an easy area to demonstrate any effects. You have to consider the technical potential, but also whether it is changeable by the people. And the last one we talk about is feasibility and scaling, which is, again, a little bit outside of classic psychology, but um, it doesn't just suffice to show that you can push people around on some questionnaire or laboratory task. We need to also have, we need to have things that can be uh, brought to bear on actual societal processes. One of the areas that has been of increasing interest to me is public protest, because it is one of the few individual behaviors that spans this sort of individual collective space. And there's some questions about whether it can affect public policy and at what time scale. Certainly, there's the possibility for it being much more effective than private consumer behaviors on the time scale of what we need to make uh, rapid decarbonization. I usually translate these, but I don't have to in this audience. Nice. And in addition to scientists getting involved, there, there seems to be a bit of a tipping point about how many other people are engaging in public protests. So we started working on this when I was in England in 2017 or 2018 or something. And really the protests were much, much larger than what I had seen before. And a thousand people getting arrested. I mean, the UK has gone through some changes in their policing about protests, but at that time that was exceptional. I mean, really, they, you, you would never see numbers like that. So um, they did, it's not like they even want to arrest you. They would say, please move, you're blocking the street. And you would say, no, arrest me. They'd say, oh, please move, and don't do all the paperwork, whatever. But um, they, you know, these were very large events full of people that weren't um, experienced protesters. Great opportunity for psychology to try and figure out what's going on. Why is so much of this changing? And in the Netherlands, a quite interesting uh, protest blocking a motorway in front of parliament, near the parliament, um, was doing this every day for, uh, I don't know, 25 days or something. It, re it just tremendously annoyed the local population and the, uh, and the police. And yeah, there were water cannons. And I mean, there was quite a large uh, response. Uh, but then at the end of this process, they had a very clear demand, which was stop the government subsidies of fossil fuel companies because we need less fossil fuel extraction. And at, throughout this process, there was a, like more discovery by journalists. On how big are these subsidies? Is it 15 billion a year? Whatever. Turns out it's 40 billion a year. And uh, 
And at the end of the process, the parliament, the government asked the parliament, please, in your next session, deliver us a series of plans to remove these subsidies. Doesn't mean that they agreed to remove them. But actually, that, that sounds a lot like a bunch of people very quickly affecting public policy. So these, this protest behavior is of particular interest. One of the angles that we're interested in is how people are reacting to the protests and whether they support them. So kind of a public opinion. I do most of this work with uh, Ben Kenward, who was previously at Oxford Brooks in the UK. And we asked people before, during, and after big protests, do you think this kind of civil disobedience is necessary? What do you think about it? Is it positive or negative? And to be honest, I strongly expected more negative afterwards, particularly in the UK, because the daily most read newspapers are right wing. What we saw before, during, and after a major public protest, and keep in mind, we're not manipulating anything. We didn't show them any messages. We didn't do anything in the study other than time when we were uh, asking these questions. We saw an increase in strong support and maybe an increase in neither support. I mean, if it, if it weren't to have gone more negative, maybe it would have polarized, right? More positive and more negative. It's not really what we see. We see mostly an increase in support. Um, and now the work that uh, Anna and I did together some years ago. Um, do you think this audience knows about this work? Do you think the audience knows about this work? Some? Who has ever written, reviewed, or edited a registered report? Any? any? Okay, let me explain what that is first. Um, you know what pre-registration is probably. So a registered report is like that, but one more level where you actually write up the whole introduction and methods, analytic plan, you have the whole uh, rationale of a study. It's reviewed by a journal and, and, and peer reviewed. And if they were to approve it through a, a process, whatever, they say, yes, we accept your article. The journal has promised we will publish your article with that introduction and that method regardless of what the results you find. The more I learn about this, the more this should be the default model of how we're doing science. Because the one part of the scientific process you cannot control is the results. If you have a well-justified study with appropriate methods and good power, then it doesn't matter what the answer was. Like then we, that answer is useful. It's, it, it, is, it is definitely an inf a more informative way and in some cases, uh, more advantageous for early career scientists because you know you're going to get a publication out of it no matter what. And it really reduces, for me, the stress of pressing that final analysis button to find out what, whether it worked or not. Because, of course, you care about whether it worked, but at least it's not affecting whether it gets published. So this was a registered report, which can be a quick uh, process, by the way. It doesn't have to take a long time. It just means you do the thinking up front about analysis. It was longitudinal, which is rare in this literature. It was an effortful intervention, long uh, a process of uh, developing these materials, which Anna did all of really, um, uh, trying to use the contents of her master's thesis to uh, identify the most important psychological predictors like, like efficacy, uh, like concern, and, and uh, introduce those to the population so that we could see whether we could push people around on whether they were willing to become more uh, engaged in activism. And the last thing, uh, still very, un any one of these four is unusual in this literature, but the, um, we actually measured whether they showed up at these events because we had partnerships with the local organizations that were holding these climate events that we were inviting them to. So it's not just a self-reported measure in, in this case. I won't go into the results in great detail, but I encourage you to check it. And uh, following up on that uh, now during her PhD. So number four that I wanted to talk about is called diversify methods. I have given you a little bit of this already. We recommend that people use precise self-reports that could at least potentially be turned into greenhouse gas emissions or other kinds of uh, units that aren't just psychological. So you'll know it's an only psychological unit when the main outcome of the paper is some sort of beta weight co coefficient between two mental constructs. And you'll know it's not 
just psychological when you can talk about kilowatt hours of uh, electricity, liters of water, or something that some other field might also use. We can do observed behavior uh, in public or getting partnerships with other companies to uh, see what something's happening. We advise people to do descriptive and qualitative work, which means if you want to study a behavior that's plastic and high impact, maybe we don't yet have the setup where we can go and manipulate it and do some sort of mediation model. We don't need that. We need to find out who is doing it, what context, what else is going on around it, which variables might be important, price, demography, things that psychologists don't study. So those are the recommendations we give here. Um, one of the most effortful projects I've ever been involved in used a kind of observed behavior. So I want to tell you about this uh, now. This was started when I was still in my PhD. Um, and then we published it in 2020 and I graduated in 2015. So you can see how long it took us to do this project. Um, that was partially the fault of the water district that we partnered with. Um, I don't want to complain about them because they also were pivotal to the project. We ended up doing a, um, an intervention where we sent mailing out to 10,000 households and we used different kinds of conditions. We told them different things. It was basically combinations of information, motivation, and behavioral skills using this model. It didn't have to be this model, but uh, well, I think that the main thing that this added that is sometimes absent is the skill. Even if someone knows there's a problem and wants to do something about it, they might not know exactly how they personally can make a difference. And in this case, the behavioral skills included things like uh, adjusting your irrigation settings, getting your toilet repaired, whatever. So these are very specific context-rich skills uh, that you might not think of if you're only thinking psychologically. Here are the main results. We see that over the course of the study, all of the households are using less water. That's because there's some outside irrigation and the study was going into winter. Okay, that's fine. And we see that all the treatment conditions are using less water than the control. Control is the main diagonal and then the treatment conditions are under it. And they don't look very different. So maybe it doesn't matter which kind of postcard they got. Although if we had to make a recommendation, we would suggest all. all. It, it, there is a problem. Your neighbors are concerned about it. Here's specifically how you can help. What was so exciting about this study was that at the end, we could say, look, this intervention cost a dollar and three cents per household, and it saved 2,000 liters of water in the first month. And that's not speculation. We, it was measured. We, we don't know anything about who read that letter, uh, their psychological concern, their thoughts about their identity, nothing. Still, for me, a very practicable, actionable result where we can take it to water districts afterwards and say, look, this is an effective way to reduce water use. Yeah. Uh, it was just once, actually. And it's just that um, the meter reading was sometimes longer and sometimes shorter after the postcard was sent them. Um, well, as we tried to adjust in the data so that zero was always the day they received the postcard, although not all the households received it on the same calendar date. This uh, graph is for standardizing them all to the day that they received it. So nothing happened on day 30 exactly. This is a sort of graph within a graph showing how many meters to 10,000 were read over this period. So by the end of the 30 days, we had read all 10,000 households. Yeah, I don't know. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe they forgot about it. Maybe they went back to their normal ways. Maybe they're making it. <laughs> ah, you think it would. 
I can't speculate that because we didn't measure out that far, but it's possible. At, at the range that we measured, the, there is area under the curve. There was a reduction. But yeah, that's that's possible. I don't know. Thanks. It's a good idea. No one has ever mentioned that before when I talk about this. It's good. It, actually, there happened to be two. We sent one postcard and then we sent a fridge magnet that had the same information on it. A week later or something, I think it was. No, no. Although if I had to speculate about that, I do think it would work because the that's similar to what O-Power does with these home energy reports. I don't know if you see this in Italy because O-Power does work here as well, but like you get your use compared to your neighbors and they find that the frequency of those notes does in fact use about 2%. So I want to tell you about another project using um, latent class analysis. Has anyone used LCA or other clustering techniques, k-means clustering? Okay, a little bit of nodding. I'll just mention briefly what it is. So far, I've been doing a kind of a linear uh, regression kind of approach where you just plot some things and you try and predict them and you try and fit a line. And that's uh, a useful and main thing that we do. But another thing you might do is ask a bunch of people a bunch of questions, and then try and figure out, are there groups of people within the pattern of data that I see? This graph only shows uh, two dimensions. But this isn't even my data. I just wanted to show you that you can try and draw clusters. But now imagine this in 13 dimensions and try and find patterns that look similar to each other. That's essentially what this analysis is doing. It doesn't always work. Sometimes it doesn't converge. Um, we decided to do this with the climate module that was in the European Social Survey, and we decided to do that because it was free. I, 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 I find this data very underused, so uh, go and uh, go and prosper. I mean, when, when we didn't have very much funding, this was the, this is where we were leading. We have all of these questions, and I wasn't really all that enthusiastic about any of them compared to the other ones. I didn't think, like, for example, that worried about climate change was more or less important than the other variables. And that led me to think this clustering was a good choice here because I didn't want to like predict this one from that one. I wanted to know, are there groups of people? What can we learn about them? In fact, this model did converge nicely across Europe. So we have four groups and this is what we labeled them, engaged, pessimistic, indifferent, and doubtful. And then we compared this to the US, which has, it seems a, a kind of a coherent fifth group, like dismissive, the climate denier group. We didn't see evidence for a separate group in Europe uh, that is characterized by that. The largest group is indifferent. And I, um, yeah, it, all three of these groups are pretty aware that climate change is happening and is bad. They just respond differently about like how uh, they feel like they're responding or their efficacy about doing something about it. In this group, for example, they're highly alarmed, but they just don't think anything can be done. This is a real risk, I would, I would say, going forward in the positive di discussion about this, because we have increasing awareness of the severity, and some people are going to just decide, ah, screw it, can't do anything. It's a bit surprising, so it's worth, yeah, ask a question. Uh, just, do you Dismiss it, let's say, for, yeah. Of course, there are climate deniers in Europe, but not so many and not such a coherent group that it came out. It, we could have had a five-factor model or a seven-factor model or something, but four seemed to be the best fit to the data. And further evidence that there's not really all that many climate deniers in Europe in 2016 already is that you can see even in that most, uh, most dismissive group, the doubtful, it's still overwhelmingly people saying that the climate is definitely or probably changing. So this denial does not really characterize this data at all. It, now it's just a question of like what to do about it. Although we do see that uh, they are not really sure why it's changing. They're not as uh, uh, convinced that it's human caused, which the climate science is very clear about. Um, so another project we did trying to get into the real world and, uh, yeah, 
do things uh, that connect to processes that other people care about. We had some contact with the smartphone manufacturer Fairphone, who makes a modular repairable smartphone that has a uh, very long life. Because the main thing you can do to reduce the environmental impact of smartphone use is just to have yours for longer. Doesn't even matter which one, definitely. So the way that they do that is by making theirs modular. The, the camera breaks, you can just swap it out in a few minutes, it's easy. The screen breaks, same thing, battery. So. A nice device. They also do a lot of work to make sure the minerals are being mined more ethically, whatever. They wanted to know a little bit about how consumers were thinking about the smartphone across four countries. So we had to do um, some translation in this project. It was challenging. And, and broadly speaking, you know, across Germany, France, Netherlands, and UK, not very many people knew about the smartphone. You can see there in the upper right that uh, brand familiarity was low, which is totally expected. But just to give you the context of that. Uh, and then how would you end up plotting this data? You could do the sort of linear regression stuff, like what predicts the willingness to uh, say that you might buy a smartphone. That would be the classic way to do this. But again, I didn't really have a hierarchy of variables that I thought were more important. And uh, I learned this, Maria was the first student in my group to graduate. One of the things that she brought um, to the group was a lot of network analysis, and I have since been using this much more. So what you might do is take all your variables and plot them like this. It is kind of just like partial correlations that you could have in a giant table, but I find it much more interpretable. So we have some idea here of um, not just the strength between different um, uh, items, but you can get two, two main things out of this. One is, this is our key variable of interest, so what is most linked to it? Okay, that's the kind of plastic you could get that from a correlation table. But what's a little bit harder to see if you're not using the network is which clusters of items look like they belong where. So for example, we were interested to know positive emotions around smartphones, uh, are, how do those relate to intensive purchase compared to negative emotions? Like you might be worried about climate change. Is that the reason you buy a smartphone? Not, that is not the reason, according to this data. It looks like positive emotions are more important. So the actionable advice here is maybe lean into feeling good in your marketing materials rather than uh, being worried about flooding. Does that work? I don't know, we didn't test that, but that's the sort of uh, takeaway. So the point of that section was to give you some diversity of methods beyond the classic social psych approach. In number five, we suggest evaluating, generalizing, and verifying. We should be doing this anyway. It's not a surprise. We've said this in other papers too. But the point is that once you publish some sort of uh, intervention that works, uh, that is not the end of the process. We also need to know where it works, under what conditions. Everything has boundary conditions. We're often testing things only in Germany, the US, the Netherlands, the UK. We need to uh, broaden the search. Uh, and this will help us with the call to get into context and local infrastructure. We've just completed and published a huge study with 60 countries. I don't know if this is really the best way to go about this, but I can at least tell you, look, we have some countries here that are not Germany, like uh, that are, uh, you know, spread out around the world. Uh, this was a massive effort led by these two. I was only uh, on a kind of a steering committee for the paper. What we did is we first polled a bunch of social scientists what kind of interventions we should use in this online study. We developed a list of 11 interventions that we thought were theoretically interesting and that might work. So it makes sense that you would do this, but instead of just the authors, we also had a kind of a pretest process. And we came up with these estimates of which ones would work. Um, and you can see that there's norm, social norms and uh, effective collective action, psychological distance, sorts of things that have come up in the last few years that suggest that they're important predictors of action. Do you want to chat about any of those? Because I'm not going to talk about them in great detail in the future. We used the WEPT task again. You saw this before. It's where you um, circle really boring numbers. 
This is my fault because I suggested that we needed some kind of measure of actual behavior instead of just the vague self-report. So yes, I don't know how many like thousands of hours of time people spent doing this and it is, yeah, I don't know if that was in the end a good idea, but at least we got a donation from this project to plant trees based on the more uh, pages they completed, which is how we motivated that uh, there was something pro-environmental happening and they did actually plant trees. Here is the estimates of how much you get of these four outcomes that we measured across all the countries. Belief in uh, in climate change, you can see, is quite high across the countries and, and tight. Not much variance here. Support of public policy to mitigate uh, climate change. Similar story, a little bit lower, but still quite high and fairly low variance. Then you get more variance in behavior. This is whether they are willing to, and then report doing, sharing a social media post about the study that they did. We weren't able to actually measure whether everyone individually did that, but I can tell you on Twitter at that time, looking at all the messages coming out, that was exciting to track. Um, but this is their self-report of having shared something on social media. And then this is the number of pages of the boring task that they completed. Yes? Can you about the sharing? This is a social media sharing. So they got to choose, you know, Instagram, uh, Twitter, whatever. And we gave them a text. Would you be willing to post this? And then did you post it? Yes. Yes. Quite interesting. Here's Italy, for example. Yeah. I mean, the Netherlands does quite bad on these categories. I'm not 100% sure what the between country comparisons mean here, but at least, at the least, I can tell you, okay, it's important to generalize and look at context because there's great variability in these outcome measures. So that's at least our first step, just to say, okay, we need to characterize there's a lot of variability. So I hope I've convinced you of number five. And our last point here is to integrate and theorize. I think in social psychology, we too often are um, imagining that we need to do this in step one, that I need to come to you and say, my theory is, you know, the theory of planned behavior. We're going to identify the predictors of most importance. We're going to do some manipulation or whatever. And then we're going to test this theory. The theory is the start of the whole process increasingly because of this gap between like the, the things we're measuring and the real world processes i feel like we need to more often do an inductive process which means you characterize something that's happening in the world and then you theorize about it later uh, it's it's not that deductive is better or worse than inductive but we we have maybe a bad balance right now that's my impression more induction less deduction so my goal here is to make the useful out ugh, make the outputs useful beyond psychology, and that can be possible, especially actionable uh, when you give advice that is in scientific units. And I think that uh, that's uncomfortable for psychologists, but of great utility, and that funding and opportunities will follow. I mean, the more I do this kind of work, the more like chemists want to work together or other groups that we would not normally work together with. And for me, that's quite exciting. And so I'm, I'm finding it uncomfortable, but really rewarding. Just two slides on the behavior measure point that I have been trying to make this whole time. This is the theory of planned behavior, super useful, influential for many years. You might think that the classic um, characterization here is that there's a gap between intention and behavior and we need to minimize the gap or there's an attitude behavior gap and we need to minimize it and that that's a useful frame but it has led us to do a bunch of measurement decisions where intentions and behavior are very highly correlated actually I don't know 0.3 or 0.4 or something so highly correlated that I begin to think that they're sharing measurement variants not just what we actually want from them so if we select the behavior items based on whether we can measure them, whether they're done by university students frequently enough to get normal distributions, whether um, people it, repeat these behaviors, um, you know, then you can't ask about like 
weatherization because too many of your sample is uh, renters or something. Those decisions shape the kinds of conclusions you make from the discipline. And this vague, never to always thing, which I'm harping on specifically because it was the only way I used to measure. The alternative is to move towards what we have called an impact perspective, where we're trying to ask about specific behaviors with specific response options and trying to measure as often as possible things in non-psychological units. Now, would you expect psychological factors to predict those physical uh, units? Well, not as strongly, not as strongly as we would expect them to predict psychological outcomes. So it doesn't mean that it's better or worse, uh, but it would generate different effect sizes, which is uh, a challenge for interpretation. And my takeaway is that theory and impact are both totally important and they're compatible, but you can't do one study and then say it's both doing this and that at the same time. Sometimes you can't do both. So for example, if you ask people as your outcome measure uh, in you know home, home residents, how often they are doing turning off the light at home and they're thinking about it reflectively and doing this conscious behavior, that's interesting psychologically, but it is not a good proxy for household energy use. We launched uh, last year a new journal called Global Environmental Psychology. Uh, this is a free journal, free for authors, free for uh, readers. It is part of this new diamond open access uh, push. We welcome quantitative or qualitative work. Um, I'm associate editor there now. And I will just stop by uh, substantiating this idea for you that this cool stuff can happen when you lean into all these recommendations. I got involved last year with a project about new kinds of plastics. So they have already developed various kinds of bioplastics. The newest one that we're working with is called PEF. It's made from types of sugars, basically. Um, you can make all kinds of plastic from the glucose. Uh, it doesn't need to be this one, but this one turns out it has really ec excellent barrier properties. So you can make drinking bottles out of it that can be much thinner because it uh, can prevent the carbon dioxide from uh, getting out of the bottle. You need much more of the fossil-based thickness of the wall to do it. So it looks like maybe this could be a useful material and the chemists and their producers want to know, how do people think about this? Uh, what do they expect it to do? Um, would they be willing to pay a little bit more for it? Because if you can answer these questions, then maybe they'll actually go and invest in these things. They don't just appear. Um, this group has already gotten funding and built an actual physical plant to build this stuff. And they're now in this pilot project where they're trying to sell contracts for this to, to bottle manufacturers and whatever. And psychologists are needed to try and understand um, yeah, how consumers would react to this. So one of the ways we could do that, and my postdoc has been in, you know, engaged primarily in this project, is to ask people about different types of recycling processes that they understand and what do they, have they ever heard of this? You can do this with clothing or bottles or the rest of it. Um, and w one of the studies we just ran, we asked people about all these different kinds of steps and they generated the bullet points. So this is how they're telling us what they understand of the physical process of recycling materials. Some of these things are accurate, some of them are less accurate, some things are missing, but at least we can try and understand how they're thinking about repurposing and recycling these materials. Um, yeah, in terms of clothing, if you ask people, you know, conventional means raw materials extracted, uh, you know, cotton or fossil fuel, um, polyester, whatever. Chemically recycled is the thing they're really interested in. I'll tell, tell you that in a second. Mechanically recycled means you take a bunch of previous uh, fabric, you uh, break it up, and then you can make it into new products, usually down cycled, meaning if it's closed, now it becomes mattress filler or insulation or something. And then resale in the second hand, you know what that is. Now, chemical recycling is what's new and it's what's funding this project. They can take now for the first time cotton polyester blend clothing, which is a lot of it, and recycle it and make it into bottles. That wasn't previously chemically possible. And they're right on the border of profitability. So they need to understand how are people thinking about this? 
And there are going to be some misunderstandings because uh, what they're actually doing is breaking it down to the molecular level and then reconstituting it. So it couldn't be cleaner. I mean, it is like exactly pure. But when people think about clothes being chemically recycled, does it sound dirty to them or, do, or are there hygiene concerns? This is the sort of thing that we're investigating. So when we ask people what were their first preference for types of clothing, they mostly want conventional or secondhand. They don't like the recycling options very much. And you can see that especially uh, unpopular was the term chemical recycling. So what we did in the most recent one, I don't have the data to show you today, but we tried to come up with different words for this that didn't involve the word chemical. Because maybe you were thinking, yeah, this is kind of a gross word. People think chemical is bad. Of course, we're all made of chemicals, the table's made of chemicals, but it, the word has a bit of a bad rap. So um, yeah, we're doing that work now. I actually have another project with some uh, other chemists, uh, which is involved in home clothes washing. So it turns out when you wash your clothes in the washing machine, it generates a lot of plastic pollution in microfibers. Those are just flushed down the drain, you never see. But you can wash your clothing in a bag or use a, uh, uh, a filter and you can get these fibers out. You can look at them, try and understand what washing regimes is causing more fibers, uh, what predicts this, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, we are doing that work now. Um, and the psychology side of it will be characterizing different changes of things over time in participation and actually consistent with many of our studies. We don't see a lot of changing through the course of participating in the study. One thing I can tell you is that pe these people who are willing to do our months long project differ from the main public. So environmental identity, the broad public is medium high, let's say, but our participants, these citizen scientists are very high. Okay, so there, this is not a generalizable group. Um, well, we need to know that it differs in certain ways. Basically, One of the results that we're following up on now is that throughout the course of this, people are getting lower in efficacy. If they do months and months of collecting the fibers that they're polluting in their own home, they feel less capable of making a difference about plastic pollution. That's kind of interesting. So I was thinking maybe they want more government solutions. So, so we're asking about different kinds of efficacy now. Yeah, please. How do you measure knowledge? Is that knowledge about the effects? I don't remember. Yeah, I think this must be scientific knowledge about plastic pollution, but I'm sorry, I don't remember. Yeah. So the overall hope we're done here now is that uh, we can have stronger behavioral science and increased conservation. Um, yeah, um, we have a lot of funding right now in the group and uh, we're very grateful for all the support. This is one of the picture I took last year in Norway when I was up there uh, taking a hike in minus 15. So thank you very much.